are now like almost on the front line. So on the left there is a base of Iraqi army and this is the field where the bad guys start being because so there, here is the building which was bombed, exploded by the ISIS. And the thing is that so the people from the villages they used to keep themselves here before and so very tough battle was happening here. So at the time everything and by now it's still not safe to be here 100%. They don't let us closer there because there can be mines so they can be bombs under some rocks. So if you step on them, it will be explosion. This is why. And so actually... Today I'll show you how people live in the country where over the last 50 years one war has followed another. A lot of holes of bullets and look at this for example, it looks like this thing that we use on the kitchen to make the carrot. How does it feel when you look out of your window and see bullet holes everywhere? Can you get used to mine cars and suicide bombers? To your kids playing football next to the destroyed ISIS base? This road was mainly uh, mined. The thing is, so there is an uh, oil pipeline going along the street. Meanwhile, people in Iraq are incredibly friendly. When they find out that you're a foreigner and speak Russian, the capital dwellers will certainly offer to pay for your coffee. And in small distant towns, they'll greet you as the dearest guest. Normally Iraqi market, so here, the, here's a barber shop. So here they sell some nuts, some chips, some cigarettes and so on. And look at this, look at this now, please. Uh, there is a shop which uh, sells like Kalashnikovs, M16, uh, pistols. Meet the local star, Iraqi Rambo. He's the most famous fighter against terrorists. There are cartoons about him. He was invited to international TV shows. His land cruiser is almost turned into a tank. <laughs> Don't be afraid. This grenade launcher is not loaded. You should start worrying if I load it. <laughs> now it's peaceful in big cities and tourists enjoy visiting them. And some districts are as pleasurable as Dubai, for instance. This is absolutely different. There's shopping malls with Burger King and something like this. All the people there don't wear these things on their heads, uh, the ladies, I mean, yes. But some areas are totally forbidden for tourists and foreigners because they're still looking for cutthroats hiding in the mountains. But they'll make an exception for us. We're heading to the kind of front line, the positions of uh, terrorists sometimes still exist. This is Liadov, and today I'm in Iraq. Some years ago, more than half of the country was occupied by terrorists of ISIS. What do we know about ISIS? Yes, they are evil men killing everyone. But we saw it all on TV. Imagine how horrible it is when all this terror happens an hour's ride away from you. Those cutthroats were this close to these houses. My Iraqi peers, who are 30, have already seen three wars. But they still manage to remain friendly and very hospitable. This is Liadov, and this is how people live in Iraq. Hello guys, it's me Anton and this is the first video I'm making in English directly. Although it was one of the hardest trips in my life, 
uh, because really some of the moments in Iraq were super scary. Uh, I still tried to speak to you in English directly uh, and I'm sorry in advance for my English. It's not my native language as you've already probably understood but uh, so sometimes I forget the words, sometimes I sell some bullshit, sometimes uh, there's pronunciation problems. Anyway I try my best uh, and I'm gonna tell you thank you uh, for the fact that you are still following me for, for a long time and if you want to support me I would really appreciate this because YouTube it's blocked the monetization for Russian bloggers from the Russian viewers. I understand it has their own purposes. I fully respect this, but it means that we lost a big part of our income. And if you want to support me, here is my Patreon link in the description. Please go and donate right now. This will really help me to create new videos, to go to some more countries and make more, uh, more reports. Uh, so, and now let's get back to Iraq. Remember those cutthroats in black? You could see them on the Euro News, BBC and all worldwide news. They always had grenade launchers on their shoulders. They rode handmade cars and welded metal plates. They built mortars from some pipes. So if you didn't get into it, they could just seem like thugs who had stolen arms to shoot a bit. What if I tell you it was probably the most powerful terrorist band of all time, with a very complicated management system? The head was a so to say president, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. There was a whole government around him. Sharia Council, intelligence service, security agency, propaganda department, financial department and army, of course. They had cells in many countries worldwide, not only in Africa and the Middle East. Small groups were in Europe, Russia, CIS countries. But their main bases were in Syria and Iraq. The whole territory this group of terrorists managed to occupy was as big as the UK territory. Can you believe it? They controlled dozens of settlements, villages, towns, where eight million people lived. It's enough for a whole country. The cutthroats were severely fought against for three years. The terrorists had lost 99% of their territories by 2017, but the remaining 1% of the land, or fewer, it's very hard to collect the data, is still under control of the terrorists. These territories are very far from big cities. They easily take tourists to Baghdad in buses now. If you decide to come too, due to safety reasons, you won't be allowed to come any closer to the places where terrorists can be. I advise you against it. It's the heart of Iraq and we are now in Kirkuk city and we are heading to the kind of front line at Slabok, the most tensionous place, so uh, where the positions of uh, terrorists sometimes still exist. There are no uh, open fire at the moment. They don't uh, fire each other, so this is should be more or less calm because although there are some parts where the bandits, they have their own... Uh, so they do, what they do is a partisan war, so sometimes they just do some bad things. So we are now heading there and so there are like three cars with us so and the special forces guards and we are really thankful that they are coming with us. This is our car. This is our car. The men don't wear armored vests but they're well armed. A gun on the hip, a Kalashnikov in the hands. The dude always keeps his finger on the trigger. One car is going ahead, another is behind. All talks are only via the radio, which is set at the passenger seat. We can't show our driver's face. He's a local security officer. He fought against ISIS. He's a tough dude. It's because the most strong attack for ISIS get, they get to this wall, like when... That wall, yeah? Yeah, like the strategy that the Peshmerga uses, all the villages like behind this mountain and after the mountain, they destroyed it. To mm -hmm. not be a base for ISIS, like mm -hmm. to stay there and make like street, one kilometer they build like a, a palace, like a palace for a based army there. Mm -hmm. like be the forces inside that you see they destroyed this. Before entering the zone, we stop at a tire fitting shop. They check the wheels for air leakage. If something goes wrong, we'll have to leave using off-road. We're on a highway that has no tire fitting shops, cafes or shops. 
but it has dozens, if not hundreds, of exploded cars. When you go through Iraq, the desert, there are some of these cars are all everywhere because so look at this one. So it was exploded and there is a good shot from here. So the thing is that all this region, all this territory was controlled by ISIS. Almost all of these cars were mined in case the Iraqi army would want to use them. They tried to get rid of the mines while freeing the territory, but they realized it'd be easier to drop bombs from planes. Twisted metal is not as dangerous as a chance to be exploded. The war was mostly for flying their flag over another settlement, so the locals sought for any shelter. There were no places to hide, so they gathered in few buildings in the middle of fields. Families who was escaped, they was based here, like in this area. Ah, the families were based, yeah. okay. And uh, the government, the government, not like government forces, not was allowed anyone if not following this road, like to come here, official permission for them to enter. All right. And okay. then the last, they bombed it. Like, it seems the military machinery is becoming more powerful with every checkpoint. Armored vehicles, like in American movies, this one looks like a tank, but it's an assault force vehicle. Yes, if you ask me if I'm scared of going to such places, well, on one hand, they've really done much work to make it safe. They have checkpoints, bases every 500 meters, they have huge fortifications, ditches. It looks tough. They say they have night vision cameras, but you can't be protected from everything, and they admit it. They've sent three cars and armed men with us for a reason. So why the hell am I going there? After the video from Karabakh, I promised myself to never get into trenches voluntarily. But they had a few trenches here. They used the local houses as shelters. The freedom of this area, like when we were uh, finished, even the families who returned, and there was some ISIS houses in this area. So the families come, they destroyed the house of the family member of ISIS. Now there's only kilometers of barbed wire and checkpoints here. Look closely, it's a handmade base the soldiers have placed sandbags. They build a concrete booth, a shed to sleep in, and a water tank to be on duty full time. service road like to secure like uh, the pump of oil. Right guys, the severest fights were on the territories with oil. The black flag terrorist strategy was to become financially independent by capturing oil deposits, plants and so on. They wanted to sell oil for cheap prices. So this is the place like uh, which they call here oil desert. The thing is that there are a lot of oil supplies under the ground. And the thing is, this is the part of Iraq, so which cannot be still controlled by Iraqi army. But the thing is that local people sleep with the guns. This road used to be mined. Now you can go here. But we're still told to be quick and not to really walk around the village. Very close to the front line, there is Iraqi, uh, like traditional village. It's a very small village. Like there is around ten houses here, so this is how it looks. So this is, this is the place, for example, where they keep chicken and the cows and so on. This have a look at this. So it's like built from I don't know this word from mud and some some things from trees. So here are some chicken. There is a cow. Yes, and the thing is that the, the, the village is uh, very small and although the terrorists came and they knew uh, they had a list of people connected with the government or Iraqi army and they started to do what they do. Salam Alaikum. Salam Alaikum. They take us to the Hall of Prayers. They treat us with an extremely strong coffee and very sour ayran. This is a sign of respect, but there's still some tension. 
Plus, the most powerful people are here, men and elders. The man with a shawl on his head is both the mayor and a local baker. His name is Ghazi al shakab Hamad al Abaidi. He says he's sincerely glad to see us, as not many reach this place, to hear the stories of the locals. But he can't smile. To be honest, I don't know how he finds the will to wake up in the morning. When the terrorists came here first, they took his two sons. They were my peers, 28 and 26 years old. My children were taken in May of 2016. They left them near Hawija. We even made an appointment to see the boys as they hadn't let us see them for two months before. Last time, when I came to see them on Tuesday, they told me to come on Saturday, as they had a celebration there. They told they'd give us the boys back on Saturday. They wanted to come with some people from the village. Who told you that? The ISIS terrorists. It was the terrorist tactics. When entering a village, they wanted to make an impression of justice fighters. They told us that the government was tyrants and apostates. They wanted us to go their way. This man's clan's name is an analogue of our last name. It's Salim An Noemi, the same as one of his brothers and sisters had. Look him in the eyes, he seems calm, but his eyes seem full of tears. They would just knock down the doors of those they were looking for. As for the others, they weren't searched that harshly. They were looking for weapons and books. What happened to your family when they came? They were tired already. My family had hidden. Have you lost a family member? I've lost five siblings. One served in the National Assembly, two in the National Guard. My cousin and a woman. They were burnt. Here, in this village? No, in another village called al -Azayev, just because they were officers. Ghazi al shakab Hamad al-Abdai believed his boys were alive to the end. As he'd been told, he and other men came to the village where the kids were kept. I was there on Friday, but I was told my two sons had been killed, and one of my relatives too. All three died on the same day. Do you understand why they were killed? There are many reasons. They cheated us. They were to let families leave Kirkuk. They charge people for clothes, for selling cigarettes, and for taking care of beards. They'll kill you if you decide to leave the place. Do you think they wanted your boys to join them? No. Yes, they wanted the whole region to join them. What were your thoughts back then? I went and saw my two sons lying on the ground, killed. I also saw my second cousin. Me and the men buried them together. We promised to avenge to kill them all, one by one. At this moment, we get reminded that we should hurry, as terrorists rarely but still attack these places. We were leaving when an elder started telling us the present state of affairs. The main problem now is sleeping cells, especially in valleys and plantations. They affect people's lives and work. People are depressed. Were there attacks? Yes, there were. At night, the security services took weapons. This is the reason why neither tourists nor foreigners are allowed here. These cars of special forces, they have a rule that they cannot take the same road to go back. Because so there are some sleeping chains, I would say, yeah. So who still have their intelligence here and then sometimes they, um, I would say, they follow these cars and this is the governmental cars are very easy to be checked because they have they have 10 windows they're the only ones who can have it according to Iraqi law uh, at the time so this uh, is uh, the reason why so these cars can just only uh, so for example at the moment I ask uh, them to come back just to film one more thing and they say that we cannot take the same road we'll uh, take another road so because the people who could have been following the cars, they would expect to come back. So this is like uh, some of the precautions to be careful. The government care about each newcomer. They don't want kidnappings or something horrible to happen. The situation is completely different in big cities. This is 
مستر من طريق هاليوود أول أفلام شفناها أرت نفا مس أندستود من شخصيات عرفناها من جوجي وطنطا مفطوطة وفوز الرمضان أهلاوي ولا زملكاوي الكورة هنا جنان Get my immunity from the Egyptian community Holy of the caring people True definition and meaning of the word unity فراعنا أفارق عرب جنود جيش منصور أحلى فن وطرب ну так, друзья, я прошел. Friends, I'm done with the inspection. It was super fast. It took about 10 minutes. I've got my visa. This is what it looks like. Check out the level of visa. It doesn't even have my last name. It's just Anton. That's it. In the past, you had to come through a complicated procedure to get to Iraq. My pal had to go to the Iraqi embassy six times to get his permission. But just three months ago, the Iraqi government opened the country to 30 others. You come with your COVID test, you pay exactly 77 US dollars, and you won't get your change if you pay 80 dollars or 100. You proceed to the airport and find yourself in legendary Baghdad. really strikes you first is the bunch of military machinery. You can see military trucks. This is an American armored vehicle Cougar. It's designed to practically go over mines. It has a V-shaped bottom which protects from fragments. Inside the city you can see American Humvees everywhere. You can land it with a parachute from a plane. The US forces are equipped with it. Many of them have special arcs installed. They're designed for urban warfare and protect the car from being crushed. <laughs> There's an infinite number of places with military men on duty. There are real fortification units which can place a detachment inside. Firing points with holes for shooting. There are gun nests for machine guns and assault rifles. The man must be having lunch though. It's quite common to see a horse cart carrying boxes behind an armored police car on the same road. There are many of them here and they're all blue. There are checkpoints everywhere. Some places have real tanks. Some have armored carriers. The majority of checkpoints look like this. It has an armed police car. Right behind me you can see a man with machine gun. A real machine gun. You can see such checkpoints almost every two to three kilometers. I think it makes people feel safe, of course. But at the same time, you realize where you are now. This is how a typical checkpoint looks. A handmade garage made of sticks and metal pieces. There's a police car with a machine gun underneath. It's a Kalashnikov machine gun, an evil killing machine. It can shoot 600 rounds per minute. But look closely, he's just sleeping, taking a nap. Here's another car. The barrel is covered here, but it's hard to tell from a distance. There are checkpoints for pedestrians too. It's absolutely common when you're walking around Iraq, Baghdad for example, and see a man with an automatic rifle just like the one behind me. This is a pedestrian checkpoint. See? He's standing with a rifle on his back. There are many car checkpoints too. You get used to a big number of military men very soon. Plus, for the last few years, they've been here for people's peace rather than for actual combat actions. Uh, and so in the past, while well, I believe in the past four months, there have not been any detonations, suicide bombers or suicide individuals, but uh, there are daily or weekly assassinations of uh, government employees, uh, activists, or anything else who is talking. Last week, an uh, uh, intelligence officer was assassinated in Baghdad. Oh, yeah. So, and for example, for tourists, it is more or less safe. Or how do you say? So, so so far, yeah, it, it's safe. There have not been any kidnapping or, uh, I think, assassination has been, let's say, um, reported of, of tourists of any country. Uh, there were actually two 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 German who kidnapped it two years ago, but uh, I think it was political reasons and they solved it uh, peacefully. This guy's name is Ozen. He's younger than me, by the way. He's 28. He is our security consultant. He met me at the airport. For the first 20 minutes, the road is absolutely empty. It seems weirdly creepy. Then you see gallo-like posts. But as soon as you overcome your inner stereotypes of Iraq and actually learn something about the country, you realize that the road is empty, not because of the war, it ended long ago, but because of COVID. The locals care about visitors and only let those who have tickets inside the airport. The posts are not gallows at all, but dummies for the cameras that control speeding. 
and it's only happening in the future. Now they drive as they want. The roads in Iraq are quite something. Here's a Gelenda wagon, and there is a donkey cart on the same street. This is really something. And here all the cars are going this way, but a motorcyclist decides to go the opposite way. Frankly speaking, I've never seen anything like this before. We call it a city of contrasts, which are mixing right in front of you. Can you guess the brand of this taxi car? This is our good old Volga. Running red lights is absolutely okay. They're dead serious when they say some of them are not obligatory. Here you can see a dude with his pal on a cart. It's kind of a mobile store, he's pushing it across traffic. These guys are going in opposite direction, but there are no accidents. Almost all cars are clean. You can meet these dudes with some cool devices everywhere. Look, buckets with a fountain. These are local car washes. There's a pump put into a reservoir in the grass on one end and a water sprayer on the other end. What do you think this is? This is a gas station. Yes, this is an actual gas station. So the guy just built a stall using planks. It looks like ones that old ladies in our countries use to sell gingerbread or strawberries. And he just poured gas into these Pepsi bottles. And this is the way they sell gas here. For this bottle, he wants 2,000 dinars. It's about $2. It's more expensive than at a real gas station. So his main clients are those who ride motorbikes, scooters, and so on. Actually, small business in Iraq is growing by leaps and bounds. These respected men in Arabian clothes made wooden stools and put a printer on each. They offer printing, scanning and everything. One can find absolutely anything in Iraqi markets. Here's a non-touristic city, Kirkuk. You can see, quite fancy. Wedding suits here. The owner is this extremely pleasant man in a blue shirt, who's posing with the Kalashnikov. Then he goes to the mirror to make himself look neat again. Have you even seen an arms dealer with a pink flower on his lapel? When I was a child, I liked arms. I was into arms. I used to spend much time with arms. How many pieces do you sell per day? One, two, three, top. Walk five minutes away from the arm shop and in the same market, you'll see incredibly cute things. Guys, please look at this. I never saw it in any country. So here they are selling these small chickens. I don't remember this word in English, sorry. And they are colored. So we just with the, I don't know how to say, we just with some color. So have a look, this is the yellow one. It's a great one. Here is a purple. Yeah? It's purple, very good one. The thing is that uh, they buy for children, like toys. It's very cute. I never saw it in any country. So come to Iraq and buy the cutest thing I ever saw. They sell them as gifts for kids as they buy more this way. This is another know-how I've never seen before. This is a small town in the north. Look, they built a handmade fountain in some old tub. Amazing. Some carps are swimming inside of it. I've never seen such. They've organized a whole system somehow. Some valves, there's a pump over there. It runs the water. It's an engineering miracle. It's just shocking. Cafes differ much from ours. They have no tables in them but everyone gets a high stool, a glass of coffee and a shisha. There are many good quality places. You just need to be prepared in advance. You come to an Iraqi restaurant and get shocked as you open the menu. Shit, everything is upside down. You may know that Arabs have right to left script, unlike we do. They don't just write, they do everything right to left. So this is how you open your menu, from the back. You open the menu and here it begins. This way you open books, passports, brochures, everything. And it doesn't stop here. 
Even Instagram, YouTube and all Iraqi smartphones are reversed too. Instagram, for example, we used to have our stories icon here, in the top left. But it's here in Iraq, see? It's on the right. The messages are on the other side. All stories go in the opposite direction. We used to have a uh, face here and text on the right, and it's all reversed here. Your avatar is on the right and text on the left. This is how they listen to music. It's just something. When you play your music, the bar goes from left to right. It indicates the time of the song. It's all the other way around here. It goes from right to left. Look, it goes the other way like this. It's amazing. Even the play button is reversed. This is so cool, it blows your mind. Iraqi TikTok is the same though. Girls change their clothes fast too. Respectable men jump into pool wearing Arabic clothes. Workers shoot pranks during lunch breaks. Here, a bull throws a slowly going cyclist in the air. Another thing that strikes you is images of military men everywhere. Here's a huge bank advertising banner. A special forces fighter was chosen as the model. Many ads depict military men as superheroes. This kebab maker has a photo of his friend wearing military uniform. He's gone, but the memory of his fight against terrorists remains. Their fight against ISIS for them is almost like the World War II for us. Almost each family suffered. Our security consultant, Ozan, didn't hold automatic rifles, but he constantly visited battle areas with the volunteers to give food and clothes to people in need. Did you see any explosion with your own yeah, eyes? Yeah, many times, a few times. Many? Yeah. yeah. Really? I, I saw IEDs, I, see, I saw controlled detonations, uh, I saw car, like suicide cars exploding. It's, I saw my city, it, it led to a point that we were we were so careful, even sitting home, we wouldn't sit near windows, we were to go to a cafe, we wouldn't sit near windows or like un until today. What do you like, mean don't sit in, in the windows? You so really care like, about so where exactly you are at, at your everywhere. apartment? So usually when the explosion happened, the window like flies away and hits you with fragments. So ah. everyone was so careful because a lot of people got injured with that. Until today, we still have that panic. If we went to a very, very crowded place, you expect that something will happen. Uh, because it's usually in a lot of crowded places in those years, explosion happened, a lot of people died for no reason. Mm -hmm. So people learned how to take care of themselves, not to go to crowded places, not to sit near windows, or either people learned homemade materials to fix it. So they would tape the window uh, with tape. Uh, so when the, the explosion happened and the window breaks, it doesn't fall on you. <laughs> yeah. Just so you tape uh, the... The windows. The window which is not broken. Yeah, yeah, which is not broken. So if the explosion happened close to you, even with the pressure of the explosion, mm -hmm. uh, the fragment wouldn't be like flying to your face or something uh -huh. like that. For example, if you hear the... If, 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 like, if, you, if you hear it, it already happened, but sometimes you can see it, but you hear nothing yet. Uh -huh. So you can see the explosion happen, and in a second or two, you you hear the you hear the sound. We pulled over on the highway right before Al Fallujah. It's a few kilometers that way. We're not going on purpose as something weird happened. It can be really dangerous for us. Fallujah symbolizes many sufferings in Iraq. The war in 2003-2004 was here. The fights were severe. The city was bombed from above. ISIS captured Al Fallujah in 2014. They planned and tried to go to Baghdad from here. It's Iraq's capital. Right now, Fallujah is under government's control. It seems it's safe there, but a weird thing has happened. Some strangers began texting me yesterday. I got messages in Instagram saying, Anton, we know you're going to Fallujah. They don't mean any harm. They want to invite us over for lunch or just meet and chat. But you never know if there's a bad guy amongst those well-wishers who is connected with those sleeper, non-sleeper cells of the terrorists who are still somewhere in Iraq. That's why we think we can't enter the city so far. We're waiting for our man. He is to come here. Some strange cars keep coming. Some people come and meet our driver. I want to see him face to face to get some information. What are the odds of meeting bad guys in Al Fallujah? None. The city is fully controlled by the army. 
How do you think? Is there a sense of kidnapping me? <laughs> Nobody can do that. We are here. <laughs> That there were in some months, some months ago, there were some explosions of some, some specific officers, things like this. Yeah, I mean that's not just in Baghdad. It's happened. They kill high-ranking uh, like officers in the army, in intelligence office. We decided to stay here for now and ask those guys from Instagram how they know I'm coming. Almost everyone in Fallujah knows I'm coming. I don't get why they care about me, but it's on social networks. A man in the city finally meets us, but I'm told to stay in the car for now. Just stay in the car when I, I say it's okay, then we'll go. Okay. Our fixer Muhammad gets into this man's car and tells us to follow them. When you enter Fallujah, you get shocked by the number of destroyed buildings. They're just collapsed and they stay that way. The terrorists would blow up houses of officers and special forces fighters too, while they were here. Now there are many checkpoints here. There are many more armoured vehicles here than in Baghdad. You can tell that the town is quite small. The buildings are short here and you can hardly meet a building without bullet holes. We're approaching the house we're to shoot in and out of the blue, a food delivery man appears. He's looking closely at me. He's been calling someone for too long, like in the Hurt Locker. He stops right in front of us. He won't take food or come in. He's just standing wearing a mask. I decide not to come close. Who knows what the hell is inside the box? Everyone tells me not to worry. He's just a food delivery guy. But this is how kidnapping looks. Bad guys hardly come wearing terrorist uniform. I get out of the car after he takes his bags. They say it's been peaceful in Fallujah for the last few years, unlike how it used to be. Cannot even walk here, but now... Really? No. Right? Even here you couldn't walk? Nobody could no, walk but... here at that, at that place. This is the bridge over Euphrates River, and this was the main road of terrorists to Baghdad, to the capital of Iraq. So. They planned to, of course, they were trying to seize the country. And then uh, to seize the country, you need to seize the capital. So, and uh, to get closer, they entered this city, which name is El Fallujah. It is a very well-known city during the war on, of 2004 uh, because it was bombed from the air very much. Who asked you to come here? One Iraqi cameraman told ABC News that most residents in Fallujah... And this, uh, that's why after 10 years, the El Fallujah should have uh, gone through one more disaster because uh, the IS, they entered the city and they bombed this bridge, right? Exactly at this place, in the middle of this bridge, because they didn't want people to leave the country, uh, didn't want to leave the city, I mean, uh, and they also didn't want to... Uh, let the, and they also wanted to make uh, Iraqi armies to stop here, so it, so it will be harder for them to, to come closer. So, and from El Fallujah to Baghdad, it was just 57 kilometers, so it's extremely close. A woman named Maida, her husband and kids tried to escape using this very bridge when terrorists came to their city. The news told us to protect our homes and take care of ourselves. They told people in masks had attacked Fallujah. Our men were guarding the territory till the morning. It lasted for long. But they weren't at your area yet? They weren't at the start, but six months after they attacked the district. After it, we moved to the city from the countryside. I was scared to stay in the country because the houses were destroyed there. When we were working outside, they were looking at us, but we wouldn't communicate with them. My son grew a beard, but they didn't accept it. What did they tell him? That he had to grow a beard. Imagine what it's like when terrorists come to your city and blow up bridges. The whole life stops. Few shops and cafes. You can't bring anything to the city. We found ourselves in a trap. My dad and I tried to escape Fallujah, but ISIS didn't let us leave. 
We lived in tough conditions. We were starving. There were bombings. Did they mine roads? Yes, there were mines. Several families died because of them. They tried to get to the other bank at night like we did. How many times did you try? We tried for six times. You can only see her eyes, but even without looking into them, you know that she's brave. She spreads strength, but she gives up when she talks about her husband. She hasn't seen him since their sixth attempt to escape. He was old but strong and energetic. He was running fast and told me to do the same, but starvation had made us tired. My daughters and I ran to the government forces. I was looking at them. My husband was stronger and he was running in front. He could cross the road, but we couldn't. Were you sure he had crossed it? Or you don't know what happened? I didn't see it. The terrorists shouted at us to come back or they would kill us. My husband was with a group of people who managed to cross it. I haven't heard from him since. Do you think about what happened? Yes, I always remember about it. <sighs> Do you want us to stop the interview to let you cry? As you watch. Maida, as many other wives, looked for her husband at friends through ads. Nothing. The terrorists were advancing like greased lightning. June of 2014, they captured the second biggest city, Mosul, within six days. My next video will be from there. Blocks are still ruined there. The terrorists didn't just capture the country, they informed the whole world. Pro videos of executions with a perfect colour grading and adjusted background were spread on social medias to terrify people, even before they approached a village. Soon, Iraqi forces fighting against them began their propaganda as the answer for their cruel videos. One of the most vivid fighters' name is Abu Azrael. But after people saw terrifying pictures of him with a gun and an axe, people began calling him Iraqi Rambo. Nevertheless, within three weeks, the terrorists captured the biggest cities. They released prisoners and went towards the capital, Baghdad. This is the Ramadi city, which is like on the way from, which was on the way, I mean, of terrorists to Baghdad. And exactly here, there was some terrorists covering. And look at the building now. Looks like it's about to drop like any moment. Now this is was the ba this was the base of IS. Uh, it's the city called Dramati, and it was on the uh, road of terrorists to Baghdad. Look at this container, and you see like how horrible are those those holes, holes of the from the bullets. It looks like this was an extremely hot gunfire, yeah, sorry, my English is not enough to describe all this atmosphere, but atmosphere is like as if you're just come back to that, war, that, to that war, because look at this, the building like, so the roof of the building has been broken. IS was uh, using the tactics when they were going through the, through the walls of uh, local people, so they entered them and not to not to show uh, themselves outside, it was just they were making holes in the walls and going through them and uh, that's why there are a lot of them in, in the houses all around here but then you, if you look at this, so all the, all the walls, a lot, of, a lot of holes of bullets and look at this for example, it looks like this, this thing that we use on the kitchen to make the carrot ready to eat, look at this. Locals tell it used to be the real headquarters of ISIS. The man's name is Yaza. At the beginning of the army's attack, we were at our homes. We saw six fights. Did you see the people who were here with your own eyes? Yes, they died while bombing. It was a chaotic mortar fire.
This is the most horrible thing. Look at the roof of this building. You can only see reinforcement bars left. It's just wild. When the army attacks, the terrorists gather around the civilians and bombing starts. Can you see those detached houses? The terrorists would get in them. In order to stay safe during shootouts and not go outside, they would breach the walls inside and move from one house to another. We were hiding in the farthest room to get protected from bullets. They would send snipers to the high ground. We found several. We found several shells here. This one is a .77. This is a machine gun. It's a powerful thing. It pierces almost anything. This is for Kalashnikov. I believe it's for 74 based on my knowledge. But I'm no pro at arms. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is a gun. So all types of arms. It makes you feel so creepy. Just look at this horror. Bullets were flying like a swarm of bees. Just look closely at what I'm holding. Even this big shell is riddled. They still find weapons and mines four years after the battle. Now we have almost a thousand pieces of explosives. We were told to put such devices into water, to break them if we find them. You know what's inside this used to be terrorist headquarters now? A shop. They're weighing sacks. They sell livestock feed. Children are playing football near it. They're not actually playing it, they're just fooling around. But when you look at them and new buildings without bullet holes, you realize that life in Iraq is improving. We're leaving Fallujah and my friends tell me we should change our car. So we're leaving by a different car. It's done in case someone, even hypothetically, got very interested in me and noticed me and our car. In this case, please remember the license plate, so on. And if someone wants to watch me, they're going to look at the car first. So we're leaving by a different car. We're going to meet the very Iraqi Rambo, Abu Azrael. It's very hard to meet. He's a real star now, as the whole world saw photos and videos of him. He has many fans and haters. His phrase, Ilatahin, which means I'll destroy you to ashes, has become a meme. No worse than Kiselyov's radioactive ashes. He's a cartoon character. The biggest TV companies pay big money to interview him. ISIS included him in their arch enemy's top list. They send squads to find the Iraqi Rambo. We were agreeing the interview for a month. He keeps changing his mind. Within the last two weeks, he agreed and refused twice. He's agreed for the third time. We're going to meet him. But he keeps changing his location. No one exactly knows where he lives, where his base is and so on. It's obvious for a man who doesn't want to be found by cutthroats in black. p.m. now. It's not the safest time in Baghdad. We've agreed to go to a specific place in Baghdad. His man is to meet us there. He is to get in our car. Then we're going together and he'll be showing us the way. It's hard for a foreigner to move around Iraq in the after dark hours. They stop you at every checkpoint, ask you why and where you're going. Incidents happen. On the day I came, a drone attacked an American base. A restaurant was blown up a week before my arrival. In the end, we reach a park and wait. Some two guys in masks appear and take us with them. They get in our car and show us the way. The atmosphere is very uncertain. Why did he agree for the interview so suddenly? Why didn't he meet us? Where are they taking us? I got distracted only by the beautiful sights of Baghdad. In some areas, you just get amazed by how much they've improved since the war. Look at Baghdad Mall. The lights make your eyes pop. 
a shiny skyscraper, an amusement park in neon lights like in American movies. Iraq really has a huge potential. According to the US Energy Information Administration, the country has the fifth largest oil reserves in the world. It has three times more of black gold than the US, more than in the UAE, Russia and Qatar. Do people benefit from it? Some think it was a huge oil deposits that brought suffering to the country. They found oil here almost a hundred years ago, but the Iraqis didn't get much from their resources for long. At the beginning of the 20th century, Iraq is part of the famous Ottoman Empire, probably the most powerful state in the 16th to 18th centuries. It was defeated in World War I. Great Britain, one of the winners, gets Iraq's territory. Twelve years later, Iraq becomes independent, but the Iraqis don't control their wealth, oil. England, France and the USA control this black gold. Or more precisely, their consortium, Turkish Petroleum, does. Anti-Western sentiments have been growing in the country for decades. Soon a young and vivid politician appears. 20-year-old Saddam Hussein. He wants to overthrow British-established Iraqi monarchy. He takes part in two coups. In 1968, he comes to power. He begins cooperating with the Soviet Union and being brave enough, he nationalizes the main company that sells oil to the West. Hussein becomes super popular with people. He improves education and health systems. In the 70s, Iraq becomes a, so to say, Dubai in terms of money, one of the richest countries in the Arab world. Oil brings 95% of the country's foreign exchange earnings. Soon, Saddam will begin to turn into a dictator, destroying all dissenters. Therefore, people remember those times in different ways today. In Saddam's time, people couldn't buy fruit. Now they can buy it even if they have a little money. Only rich people could afford fruit. For example, a banana cost a thousand Iraqi dinar. The money value wasn't the same back then. In Saddam's time, a teacher's salary was 3,000 dinars. This man's name is Allah. He becomes bewildered when I ask him if it was better under Saddam or now. He says, take simple drinking water as an example. In Saddam's time, they bought ice, added it to water and drank it. Now they have fridges, but no electricity. The difference is that people can buy more things now, if they have an income. They can buy a fridge, mobile phone, AC, but they still live below the poverty line. This is what the old town of Baghdad looks like. The atmosphere is incredible, like you're in Aladdin's world, like you're in a movie, but a Disney one, in a true life one. These gorgeous mosques with mosaics, it's insanely beautiful. It's like a very ancient true bazaar, you know? The cars are old, these endless tuk-tuks going back and forth, some motorbike units. What unusual architecture. I've never seen anything like that. They're almost like uh, ancient Greek columns from below. The old town of my hometown, Samara, is above. Look at these wooden huts. The columns support them. You should notice that almost all of them are burnt. The windows are broken. Actually, many people live here. The atmosphere is unusual, cool, and quite pleasant. The old town is when you walk along a paved street, and around you, there are buildings that never stop becoming taller. Not finishing buildings is quite common here because your family gets bigger and you build another floor above and the family keeps living in. This great kid's dad, Mustafa, got married and took his wife to his parents' house and he built another floor above their room. I spent 4 million dinars on this room. It's 2,700 US dollars. What's your occupation? I'm a military man, a soldier of the Iraqi army. Yes. You must have a good salary. Not really big, actually, but I, I'm a private. Uh, 1,200,000 dinar. It's just $820.
The advantage is that you don't have to pay tax for the house. Is it true that there are no tax systems in Iraq, so you don't have to pay taxes? We don't. Here, if you have your own house, you don't have to pay to the government some extra money every month. But the disadvantage is that there's not enough electricity, so we buy electricity. It's not cheap. So there's no state program providing electricity? There is, but it's not for the whole day. How long then? About 10 hours or so. 10 hours a day and only electricity. Yes, it's maybe 12 or 8 hours. Sometimes no electricity for 2 or 3 days. So we buy private generators and pay for the amount that we use. Try to guess how much they pay per month. $50? $100? $200? Or maybe more. $1,000? If you have a house with an AC, fridge, freezer, TV, so you pay $150 a month. $150? Yes, about. It's a pretty penny. It's quite much for us. Yes, everything is expensive here. We have running water, and it's almost for free, by the way. People save it if something happens, like a surprise. So the power is off. Yes, we have to wait. Yeah. <laughs> the power is on again in five minutes. Lida says she got used to it quick. She moved from Russia two and a half years ago. Love at first sight, almost. She met an Iraqi guy with a wonderful name, Gide. They married three weeks later. Now they're bringing up this QT. It might have been different if they'd met in Iraq. This brak, marriage here is almost like an agreement. Sometimes a young man and lady meet. It happens quite often, actually, but not in person. Sometimes a guy's mother or sister sees a girl and tells at home that the girl is good and pretty. Then the women go to meet each other. Am I right? after the men come to meet. If they come to an agreement, then the couple can meet and communicate. Come to an agreement about what? For example, about the terms of their living, where they are gonna live. It depends on family's wealth, but sometimes girls make a condition not to live with parents to live separately. It happens often now. They agree on gifts, what appliances, how much gold. In grams? In kilos, not in grams. Not in grams, in kilos. In kilos, sometimes. If the boy and the girl don't like each other, there'll be no wedding, despite the agreement. But if they marry, there are special rules. You can't touch anyone else's woman. Look, Gide put the mic on Lydia on his own. For example, even when you're at the shop, you can't touch each other while giving money. No, you can't touch a woman. If it's change, they can give it to we are the men. I was surprised when they were talking to me without looking at me. In Russia, I was treated as a sign of disrespect, like they are not even looking at me. Here, it's a sign of respect for a woman. He doesn't check her out. Another sacred thing is hope. The Iraqis almost never let others come in further than a special room. Even if you're invited to stay over, you'll be sleeping in the room next to the entrance. Even if you need to use the bathroom, you can't go there alone. There are exceptions. And maybe your friends will let you in. But in general, it's this way. I was an exception too. And this is how the regular house looks inside. We have a chance to enter because uh, so the host of this uh, flat allowed me to enter. For example, this is the place where 10 people live here normally. So uh, even more than 10. And this man is uh, just the head of the family. He's taking care of everyone. So this is how it looks. It's a pretty big one. But actually, this is the place for everyone. There are not a lot of uh, you know, space, not a lot of rooms. Actually, they're almost like two rooms for all the people and uh, so here for example they can have rest they they watch tv so this is the place where they also clean the uh, clean clean the dishes they can clean the everything and here is the place where they sleep here is the bedroom they also allowed me to enter don't think that i'm uh, uh, entering the house without permission uh, here it is so this is uh, also pretty cozy room so it's not the it's not a rich one, but uh, anyway, here is everything that we need. Uh, for example, so they have a fridge here. Uh, the, this is the bed where they actually sleep. And actually also there is a kind, some kind of sofa or something like this. And what is interesting, what is very curious detail about this place is that, for example, you see the air conditioning, but it's not working at the time. And for example, the fridge is not functioning at the time. Also, they all, I can hear that it's not functioning, functioning. And they told me this is the thing because the electricity is pretty, pretty expensive here. This is the place where they cook uh, the dinner for everyone. For example, today they're having, uh, I don't know this word in English, guys. This is something that is in stomach of the animal. And it's also, it's much cheaper than, for example, regular meat. 
and that's why they just pull the water inside and boil it and also they have rice yeah this is how their kind of this family lives the head of the family is the very Allah, kind and hardworking. How much do you get per day or month? 2,000 dinar per day. It's about $7. It's peanuts for Iraq. Is it enough for you? It's not enough. That's why he also works. They spend much on meds for the elders. Allah's sister shows her hand. It was a sniper. Does it still hurt? Yes. When did this happen? In 2006. She thinks she got lucky. 2006 and all those years were horrible. My father was sitting here at the door. A bullet hit him right in the heart. He was killed. My brother was kidnapped. They said he died as his body wasn't here at that moment. We didn't know where he was. We've been told he's dead ever since. Do you know where the bullet that killed your father came from? A terrorist from Al-Qaeda did it. Based in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda were responsible. But the US President George W. Bush soon starts telling everyone that the one who supports terrorism is the President of Iraq, Saddam Hussein. He's a dictator. He's been in power for 23 years. His portraits are all over Iraq. He orders to write his name on every 10th brick used during the restoration of historical Babylon. In Baghdad, as in North Korea, a museum of gifts to Saddam is open. He is re-elected during a referendum with his, the only name on the voting paper. At his second last vote, he got 99.96%. And on his final one, he got 100%. Saddam also hates Americans, says that the US plans are not going anywhere, but against humanity. Many support him in this. The US, in its turn, has also been openly trying to overthrow him for four years. They say that Saddam is developing weapons of mass destruction and supports terrorism. Two years after 9-11, the US and UK begin a military invasion of Iraq. Look, this is a pretty typical Baghdad landscape. You can see such things like old buildings. They are grey and need to be painted. If you look closely, you can see that these buildings are riddled with bullets. Top, middle, ground floor are completely riddled with holes. Some of them are fixed, many of them are not. Aviation, artillery, infantry. Within less than a month, US and British troops defeat Saddam's army, advancing from three directions. They enter Baghdad, dividing the country, into those who smash overthrown Saddam's statue with a shoe, and those who, who a few kilometers away, raise their hands in his honor and shout, we will give our blood and soul for Saddam. Saddam is hiding, changing his location three times a day, but they find him underground in a village, along with $750,000, two Kalashnikovs, a gun, and two bodyguards. He gets put on trial, spends three years in solitary confinement. He's allowed to hang portraits of his two dead sons, but only along with George Bush's portrait. He smokes cigars his family sends him. He waters the garden in an exercise yard where weeds are the only things that grow. He's sentenced to death by hanging. It is greeted very ambiguously. Saddam's followers go underground. Radicals become more active and a guerrilla war begins. Now I'm in one of the areas of Baghdad and it looks very calm at the moment. So for example, here are green trees, so it's more or less clean. So people are friendly, they cheer me at the moment. And you look at those buildings and it seems to be that like, oh, these are just regular block of flats where people live. But if you look closer, you'll understand that there are a lot of holes from the bullets. There's just dozens of, dozens of them, even maybe hundreds. And if you look even more closer, you'll see that some of the uh, floors were targeted. So for example, look at this 10th floor. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of holes. This is the road which US Army took uh, uh, to get there to green zones. Uh, the, uh, so in, in the years they were here. And though, uh, in these flats, there were people who were trying to resist and they were shooting US Army uh, cars, uh, patrols and so on. And Americans, they uh, shoot it back trying to kill those who try to ambush them. So, and that were the resistance. And the interesting thing and, and the curious detail is that at the moment those block of flats are, so they're full of people. They just 
they live their normal life. So for example, they gr grow something green on their balconies. They have their socks. Uh, these buildings are located on the opposite side of town, the very place where Ali's friend's dad was shot and his sister's hand too. Adnan Abu Amin has been working here as a salesman for many years. When he started the resistance here, the American troops came. Al-Qaeda fought against them. They defeated the Americans, then began winning the police and army. The division on religious grounds began. There were constant explosions. The situation was getting worse. An armed fight happened on Toledo Square which resulted in disputes and conflicts between Shiites and Sunnis. What moment of your life seems to you the hardest? When they were going with three or four killed people and dead body were on the streets. This man's name is Haji. He owns the oldest cafe in Baghdad. He's a very wise old man, but as he thinks about it, his eyes get wet. He says all days have been as one for him for the last 13 years. His whole family, four children, grandson, wife, all were gone in an instant. I was sitting where I'm sitting now. On March the 5th, 2007, a KIA truck came to the neighboring street and exploded. All buildings collapsed. The cafe got burnt down. 60 people died. I got slightly wounded, but my children were at the nearest printing house. They got severe, fatal wounds. We couldn't get their bodies out. We came the following day with our relatives and some men from Baghdad. We managed to get the bodies out, which were a mess. Then we buried them. When I ask if it was better or worse under Saddam, he looks at me and doesn't seem to understand what I'm talking about. Because of the misfortune that happened to the boys, their mother lost her mind and died. This misfortune prevents me from thinking about anything neither about the politics nor about the rulers. I feel like I was killed by a butcher, like I was cut into pieces myself that day. I buried her next to the children and I dug my own grave waiting for my own death. I keep thinking of the time I'll meet them. To be honest, I've fallen in love with this country. Iraq is an amazing place with people who have had more sufferings than anyone else, but they've preserved both their hearts and love for the country. For example, our attendant, Mohammed, his house was destroyed at war like hundreds of others. One day, we was like uh, sitting in this house peacefully and I just saw everything coming inside. Even the front door, you saw it. It was in the, inside like the house. And I just pushed my mom and my father was on the street. So all this, mem like this hood, it was totally destroyed. And we don't know what's the reason for that. And my brother lost his ear, like he, he can't listen. And he chose to move to Europe just for healthcare, like to just make operation for him, surgery. And because he didn't get the good healthcare here and there was no responsibility about him and he didn't get anything. And he chose his destiny to be far away from, to count, like from Iraq and from Kirkuk to continue his own life. Mm -hmm. And. Uh... So he's not coming back? He's, he will not come back again like to Iraq, no, for sure. Because, yeah, this is when it touches like your life. And so this, in this case, did you ever think about the fact that... Uh, like I was here, but I'm lucky that I didn't get hurt. Like in the moment when the explosion happened in my house. Like I was here, like sitting here in mm -hmm. this area. And it, it, it hurt my soul, like... There is, like, Iraq is suffering, like, in a lot of situation, but I really proud I'm Iraqi, because we continue fight in our life, everyone from their position. And sometimes I, I feel my soul is broken, but I continue to come back again and again to continue this life. He's over 30, but he still has no family yet. But this isn't common for his culture. Do you think uh, that you still don't have family because you're afraid something bad will happen again? To be honest, yes. Like, I don't want to start a family because I don't know what their destiny. Like, if I, I have a child, like, if he go through what I go... Like, this is not future to build for your children. For that reason, I want to be sure, like, my country... Because I'm not thinking to leave the country, even what happened. If another war starts, like, hopefully not. 
but I will not leave this country. Like I'm staying here forever. So one one of the reasons that I didn't start like family and I'm old to start it even like in my tradition and culture that I don't know what what their future, what their destiny. Guys, in the next video, I'm going to tell you about how the US invasion ended. We're going to talk with a very Rambo who still goes to special operations on seeking the terrorists in the mountains. This is the weapon I fought with. It has two shooting modes, single shots and double shots. This is a night vision device. It helps you see in the dark. Only those who have night vision device can see at the dark and identify people. It has laser to identify the enemy's victims or to aim at them. Each region has its machinery and weapons. I have M4 and a Kalashnikov, but as long as I had a grenade launcher mounted, I liked it. I have much experience in using it. It's not the only thing I carry. We have a grenade launcher and many other arms. Check out his armoured Land Cruiser. There's a machine gun support on the roof. There's a cage for hostages in the trunk. Wow! It's a specifically designed cell no one can escape from. As long as you get inside, there's no way out of it. When you end we're also going to ISIS former capital in Iraq, Mosul, which is still completely ruined. It's just the ruins, it's not the city, it's just the ruins. Every house has been bombed. show you a fighter's action video. He was surrounded by terrorists and wanted to film a goodbye video. Here's this moment. We'll visit Iraq's traditional peoples who live in swamps, and they graze cows in reed grass. Swamp Arabs have been living here for a long, long time. They use boats like these. They've gone past us. They breed fish here. Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. It's been Liado, and this is how people live.